believe it or not, there is such a thing as just war. A war that is justified. It's a well-established doctrine in international law. Actually, the oldest doctrine in international law. Vladimir Putin, the president of the Russian Federation, had instructed its forces as the commander-in-chief to enter the territory of Ukraine. The technical term is invasion. He had invaded Ukraine from four different directions. He offers three reasons for his actions. And the question is, do these three reasons justify his actions? Do they render these, this act of war a just war? And this is the topic of today's video. Is, Russian, is Russia's invasion of Ukraine a just war? The three reason, reasons that Vladimir Putin prefers are, number one, Ukraine's dalliance with the West, and more specifically with NATO, which is a military defensive alliance, threatens the national security of Russia. Ukraine shares a long border, a common history, and many cultural roots with the Russian Federation. And if it veers towards the West, if it becomes a part of the West, definitely if it becomes a part of the NATO military alliance, then military assets of the West can be positioned at Russia's immediate and direct borders, the near abroad. Russia, says Putin, cannot tolerate such a threat to its national security. The second reason he offers is that Ukraine is an artificial entity. It's not a real country. It doesn't have a real history or continuity in history. It was cobbled up by the Soviet regime during the time of the USSR. It was cobbled up from disparate parts, many of which used to be a part of the Russian Federation. So some territories of the Russian Federation had been amputated by the Soviet regime and handed over to Ukraine, says Putin. And the prime example is Crimea. Putin had invaded and occupied Crimea in 2014. The third reason that he offers is that there are sizable Russian-speaking and Russian ethnic minorities within um, Ukraine to the east and to some extent in other parts. And these Russian minorities want autonomy. They want self-determination. They do not want to be under the yoke of the government in Ukraine. They don't feel Ukrainians, they feel Russian. And they had established two autonomous governments, two autonomous republics, which Russia had recognized diplomatically three days ago. And Putin claims that the authorities in Kiev, which is the capital city of Ukraine, the authorities in Kiev are committing genocide against the Russian minority uh, to the east of the country. And this genocide is premeditated. It's a part of a plan to subdue and subjugate the Russian minority or even to eradicate and eliminate it. He uses words like genocide. Now, 14,000 people had perished in the civil war between the Ukrainian authorities and the Russian minority. That part is true, but it's nowhere near a genocide. It's more like an insurrection, an insurgency, uh, or to put, a, to put a benevolent light on it, a freedom movement. <clears throat> Still, there is a civil war going on there. Civilians are getting killed in very large numbers. So Putin says, as a fellow Russian, as a compatriot, as a member of the same ethnicity as my brethren and sisters in the east of Ukraine, I am obligated to help them. I'm obligated to secure their safety and longevity. I am the big brother. I'm supposed to protect them from the onerous, harsh, unforgiving and hateful hand of the authorities in Ukraine. I remind you that a similar claim had been made by Adolf Hitler in 1938 and 1939 when he had invaded and occupied 
Czechoslovakia. At the time, Hitler claimed that he is doing it in order to protect a large 3 million member minority of Germans in Czechoslovakia. The Germans were mainly in an area called Sudeten, and they were discriminated against by the Czechoslovak authorities, but they were not under any life threat. And additionally, they undermined this. They acted as a fifth column, as a Trojan horse in Czechoslovakia, collaborating openly with the Nazi regime against the independence and territorial integrity of Czechoslovakia. So they were a hostile minority. The same way the Russians in Ukraine are hostile to Ukraine. So we have many unsettling parallels between Putin's third claim and Hitler's claim on Czechoslovakia. But put all these aside, even if all these reasons were true and correct and 100% conformed, had 100% conformed to reality, even if these claims had not been counterfactual, and some of them are counterfactual, but some of them are real. I do think, for example, that Russia, Russia's national security is encroached upon and endangered, endangered by the successive waves of expansion of NATO, which is a military alliance. So Putin has some points, some good points, and some bad points, and some fake points, like every other dictator in history. But the question is, even if all of Putin's claims were 100,000% accurate, real, justified, grounded, evidence-based, would that have made his war in Ukraine a just war under international law? That is the topic of today's uh, lecture. In an age of terrorism, guerrilla, and total warfare, the medieval doctrine of just war needs to be redefined. Moreover, um, issues of legitimacy, efficacy, and morality should not be confused, as they often are. Legitimacy is conferred by institutions. Not all morally justified wars are therefore automatically legitimate wars. Frequently, the efficient execution of a battle plan involves immoral or even illegal acts. Ask any Israeli. As international law evolves beyond the ancient percepts of sovereignty, it should incorporate new thinking about preemptive strikes, human rights violations, and so on and so forth, as casus belli, as a cause for war. It should also, international law should also adapt and evolve to take into account the role and the standing of international organizations, insurgents, and liberation movements. And yet, inevitably, what constitutes justice depends heavily on the cultural and societal context, narratives, mores, and values of the disputants, of the interlocutors. And so, one cannot answer the deceivingly simple question, is this war a just war, without first asking, according to whom? In which context? By which criteria? Based on what values? In which period in history? Where? Etc. Too many questions. Being members of Western civilization, whether by choice or by default, our understanding of what constitutes a just war is crucially founded on our shifting perceptions of the concept of the West itself. I will not go into what is the concept of the West right now. I'll do it in future lectures. Right now, I want to focus on the doctrine of just war in international law. Imagine a village of 220 or so inhabitants. This village has one heavily armed police constable, policeman, police officer, flanked by two lightly equipped assistant police, uh, assistant policemen, or shall we say deputy sheriffs. This hamlet, this village, is beset by a bunch of ruffians and thugs and scoundrels. These thugs, these criminals, molest their own families, and at times they violently lash out at their neighbors. These delinquents mock the authorities, they ignore the decisions and decrees of the authorities. 
And yet, the village council, the only source of legitimacy, refuses to authorize the constable, the policeman, to apprehend the villains and to dispose of them by force of arms, if need be. The elders of the village see no imminent or present danger to their charges. They are afraid of potential escalation, whose evil outcomes could far outweigh anything the felons can achieve and did achieve. And so, incensed by this laxity, moral laxity, the policeman, the constable, backed only by some of the inhabitants of the village, but not by all of them, the policeman breaks into the home of one of the more egregious thugs, the worst criminals, and he expels this criminal or even kills him. The policeman claims to have acted preemptively and in self-defense, as the criminal, long in defiance of the law, was planning to attack the representatives of the law, the policeman and his family. Was the constable, was the policeman, the police officer, was he right in acting the way he did? Was he right to unilaterally and without the backing of the village elders council, enter the criminal's home and kill him? Was his act legitimate? On the one hand, the policeman may have saved lives. May, he may have prevented a conflagration whose consequences no one could predict. On the other hand, by ignoring the edicts of the village elders council, by ignoring the expressed will of many of the denizens of the village, the police officer had placed himself above the law as its absolute interpreter, reification and enforcer. So what is the greater danger? Turning a blind eye to the exploits of outlaws and outcasts, Saddam Hussein's, Vladimir Putin's? So should we turn a blind eye to them, rendering them ever more daring and insolent? Or should we act unilaterally to counter such outcasts and pariahs, uh, undermining the communal legal foundation in the process and possibly leading to a chao chaotic situation of might is right? It's a conundrum. If we leave, let people like Adolf Hitler, Saddam Hussein, Milosevic, and recently Vladimir Putin do as they please, invade other countries, create mayhem, not only in Ukraine, but in the Middle East and many other parts of the world, if we let them off the hook, we risk an escalation by definition, because they're going to become more daring and more impertinent. If, on the other hand, we attack them unilaterally, preemptively, and without the backing of global inst institutions, institutions of the international community, we are outlaws as much outlaws as, as Vladimir Putin or Saddam Hussein. Countering such pariahs and outcasts unilaterally undermines the common legal foundation and possibly could lead to situations which are unpredictable. And also, acting this way establishes the rule of might is right. In other words, when ethics and expedience conflict with legality, which should prevail? To answer this age-old question, we need to take a detour and go back a mere 800 years. Enter the medieval doctrine of just war. Justum bellum, more precisely, jus ad bellum. The doctrine of just war was propounded by Saint Augustine of Hippo in the 5th century AD and augmented by Saint Thomas Aquinas, 1225-1274, in his Summa Theologica. Francisco de Vitoria added to it, he lived it between 1548 and 1617, as did Francisco Suarez, 1548-1617, 
And above all, Hugo Grotius, 1583, 1645. Hugo Grotius or wrote an influential tome, Jure Belli Ac Pacis, on rights of war and peace. He published it in 1625. Later on, people like scholars like Samuel Paffendorf, 1632-1704, Christian Wolff, 1679-1754, and Emmerich de Vattel, 1714-1767, added to this masterpiece of juridical thinking. Modern thinking, th thinkers about the issue of just war include Michael Walzer in Just and Unjust Wars, published in 1977, Barry Paskins and Michael Dockrill in The Ethics of War, 1979, Richard Norman in Ethics, Killing and War, 1995, Thomas Nagel in War and Massacre, Elizabeth Anscombe in War and Murder, and so on. So, as you can see, the issue, the issue has been alive and well for well over 800 years. According to the Catholic Church's rendition of this theory, of the theory of, of the doctrine of just war, what the Catholic Church has to say about, the, about just war was set forth by Bishop Wilton D. Gregory of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in his letter to President Bush on the invasion of Iraq. Later, letter was dated this, uh, September 13th, 2002. The bishop said, the good bishop said, going to war is justified only if these conditions are met. I'm reminding you, this is a position of the Catholic Church. By the way, Russians are not Catholic. They are Pravoslav. They belong to the Orthodox side of the Christian Church. But anyhow, here's what the Catholic Church has to say. Going to war is justified only if these conditions are met. That the damage inflicted by the aggressor on the nation or community of nations is lasting, grave and certain. That all the other means of putting an end to this aggression must have been shown to be impractical or ineffective. That there must be serious prospects of success for the war and that the use of arms must not produce evils and disorders graver than the evil that is to be eliminated by the war. A just war is therefore a last resort, all other peaceful conflict resolution options having been, having been exhausted. You first have to try everything before you go to war, which Russia hadn't really done. It pretended to engage in diplomacy, but it 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 demand it made such demands that were clearly unacceptable. I think with the aim of making sure that diplomacy fails. The Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy sums up the doctrine of just war this way. The principles of the justice of war are commonly held to be one having just cause especially and according to the United Nations Charter, so exclusively self-defense. Number two, being formally declared by a proper authority. Number three, possessing the right intention. Number four, having a reasonable chance of success. Number five, the end being proportional to the means used. And yet, the evolution of warfare, for example, the invention of nuclear weapons, Putin threatened to use nuclear weapons in this war, by the way. So the invention of nuclear weapons, propagation of total war, war that involves the civilian population, the ubiquity of guerrilla and national liberation movements, the emergence of global border hopping terrorist organizations, of totalitarian regimes, of rogue failed states, even of <laughs> half demented superpowers, <laughs> like sometimes the United States. So the evolution of warfare requires that we modify these principles by adding at least a few more. I would add the following. Number six, that the declaring authority, the authority that declares war, is a lawfully and democratically elected government. Dictators can never declare a just war, in my view. 
And number seven, that the declaration of war reflects the popular will. I would also add, modify some of the principles of the doctrine of just war. I would extend the third principle. Remember, the third principle is that you possess the right intention when you declare war. So I would kind of extend it by saying the right intention, the only right intention, is to act in just cause. I would extend principle number four to remind you. Principle number four is having a reasonable chance of success, that the war has a reasonable chance of success. I would extend it. A reasonable chance, also a reasonable chance of avoiding an annihilating defeat. I would extend principle number five, which is the end being proportional to the means used. I would extend it by saying that the outcomes of war are preferable to the outcomes of the preservation of peace. And still, the doctrine of just war, conceived in Europe in eras past, is fraying at the edges. It's not holding well. Rights and corresponding duties and obligations, they're, they're ill-defined in this doctrine, or they're mismatched. What is legal and what is not legal is always is not always what is moral or what is not moral. What is legal and what is not legal is not always what is legitimate and not invariably uh, uh, legal. So, what is legal is not always what is moral, and what is legitimate is not invariably legal. And yet the doctrine conflates all these and creates, honestly, a bloody mess. Political realism and quasi-religious idealism sit uncomfortably within the same conceptual framework. Norms are vague and debatable, while customary law is only partially subsumed in the tradition, in treaties, conventions, other instruments, as well in the, as in the actual conduct of states. After 800 years, we had failed to come up with a clear-cut, unequivocal, unambiguous compass according to which states and heads of states can navigate the decision-making, something to calibrate passions, emotions, and fears, something to help people reacquire rationality and the calculus of utility in the heat of battle. The doctrine of just war is an utter unmitigated failure because it's so vague, it's so laden with religious percepts, it is so intimately tied to the concept of nation-state in an age where sovereignty is subsumed or sacrificed very often. It is not well adapted to deal with new manifestations of warfare, such as fighting terrorism or protecting the rights of minorities. The most contentious issue is, of course, what constitutes a just cause? What is this meaningless phrase? Self-defense, in its most narrow sense, a reaction to direct and overwhelming armed aggression, is of course a justified casus belli. But what about the use of force to deontologically, consequentially, ethically, axiologically achieve other goals? What if we use force to accomplish other commendable, ethical uh, requirements and demands? What if ethics tells us to use force to protect someone, to secure someone's life, to enhance someone's well-being, to prevent someone from being enslaved or subjugated or invaded? Let me give you a few scenarios where the phrase just cause crumbles. Just cause cannot be limited only to self-defense. There's something wrong with it because there are many other causes 
which have nothing to do with self-defense and are as just. There are many other causes which require aggression, premeditated, planned aggression, and they are just, despite the fact that you are the initiator of the aggression. Let me give you a few examples. To prevent or ameliorate slow motion or permanent humanitarian crisis. To preempt a clear and present danger of aggression, anticipatory or preemptive self-defense against what Grotius called immediate danger, clear and present danger. Another possibility, to secure a safe environment for urgent and indispensable humanitarian relief operations. Number four, restore democracy in the attacked state. Regime change. Regime change is a Western invention, not a Russian one. Number five, to restore public order in the attacked state. Number six, to prevent human rights violations or crimes against humanity or violations of international law by the attacked state, which is exactly Putin's claim. Number seven, to keep the peace, peacekeeping operations, and enforce compliance with international or bilateral treaties between the aggressor and the attacked state, or the attacked state and a third party. Number eight, suppress armed infiltration, indirect aggression or civil strife, aided and abetted by the attacked state. <clears throat> Number nine, honor one's obligations to frameworks and treaties of collective self-defense. So one NATO member is attacked, all NATO members counterattack. Number 10, to protect one's citizens or the citizens of a third party inside the attack state. Number 11, to protect one's property or assets owned by a third party inside the attack state. Number 12, to respond to an invitation by the authorities of the attack state. This happened in Belarus, Kazakhstan recently. Um, to respond to an invitation by the authorities of the attacked state and with the express consent of the authorities of the attacked state to militarily intervene within the territory of the attacked state. Number 13, to react to offenses against the nation's honor or its economy. And number 14, to preserve national security. Reviewing Russia's aggression against Ukraine in the past few days, in light of this novel, much enlarged and expanded definition of what constitutes a just war, a new doctrine of just war for the 21st century, renders this aggression not entirely unjustified. While I definitely condemn any use of violence and it had not been necessary in this particular case, I think, still, some of the claims made by the Russian Federation in its invasion of Ukraine fall under this expanded doctrine of just war. Unless these issues are resolved and codified, the entire edifice of international law, and more specifically the law of war, is in danger of crumbling. The contemporary multilateral regime proved inadequate and unable to effectively tackle genocide, for example, in Rwanda or Bosnia. The contemporary perception of just war and the regime, the international community, they failed to tackle terrorism in Africa, Central Asia, and the Middle East, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, India, Israel, uh, Pakistan, North Korea, Iran, and tyranny in dozens of members of the United Nations, most notably perhaps China and the Russian Federation. This feebleness of the international order is inevitably, has inevitably led to the resurgence of might is right unilateralism as practiced, for instance, by the United States in places as diverse as Grenada and Iraq and by Russia in places as diverse as Georgia and Ukraine. This pernicious and ominous phenomenon is coupled with contempt towards and suspicion of international organizations, 
treaties, institutions, undertakings, and prevailing consensual order. In a unipolar world, reliant on a single superpower for the security of the world, the abrogation of the rules of the game could lead to chaotic and lethal anarchy with a multitude of rebellions against the emergent American empire. I put the blame at America's feet. America failed to create coalitions, including coalitions with other superpowers, instead going it alone with the help of its surrogates like the European Union. Other superpowers are fighting back now. Russia, China, China is just, just around the corner. It's going to be, it's going to become, there's going to be a military conflict involving China soon, in Taiwan probably. International law, the formalism of natural law, is only one of many competing universalist and missionary value systems. Militant Islam is another, for example. The West must adopt the former to counter the latter. Soft power, coalition building, har harmony in international relationships, empathy in understanding the other party's concerns and fears, where the other party is coming from, culturally, historically. All these are much better at creating a stable international order with reduced aggression than any display of F-35s and, and soldiers, or any invasion or incursion across state lines. Vladimir Putin is a dictator, is cold-blooded, calculated, some say psychopathic. I wouldn't beg to differ, but he is acting in the interest of the Russian Federation as he sees them. We may not see eye to eye with him, but the dialogue that the West claimed to have attempted with him was derisory, ridiculous. There was no real attempt to cater to the needs and fears of the Russian Federation. It's a country that's been invaded dozens of times, most notably in the 20th century, with cal calamitous outcomes. 20 million Russians died. We should have been more understanding and empathic. And instead, the West went the way of confrontation. Russia does not need the West. It has $800 billion in cash. And it has China. It is the West that needs Russia for gas and for the stability of the order of peace and security in Europe. To pretend otherwise is megalomaniacal and delusional. And the West is about to discover this, how impotent it is. When you alienate powerful others, be prepared for a backlash, especially if these others are thuggish, are bullies, are ruffians, and a bit and a lot criminalized. You don't poke the snake, snake with a stick unless you make sure in advance that you have an antidote.